Hi, and welcome to the last section of our matter unit. This section is going to deal with cells, what they look like and how they're structured. We're going to begin with a discussion of cell size. And for that, I figured I'd go with this famous movie poster for a famous horror movie called The Blob, which was essentially about the world's largest single-celled organism that would surround and envelop people and other things and digest them, getting larger all the time. In fact, The Blob is a physical impossibility, but that's kind of an interesting thought if you think about it. So this is Valonia ventricosa. It is a type of algae. It's about four inches long and it is about as big as any one single cell could ever get. There are limits on why cells can't get any bigger than something like this. And even this is incredibly rare. Most cells are microscopic. And those limits are what we're going to talk about in this video. The limits to cell size. The question we're trying to answer in this video is what are the limits to cell size? In this video, first we'll talk about the normal size of cells and the limits to cellular size. And then we'll talk a little bit about some adaptations that some cells use to maximize their surface area as examples of a much larger phenomenon. But I've started here with a ruler. We of course are only interested in the metric ruler and we're not interested in the entire metric ruler because most cells are very, very small. So we're going to blow up this little region of the ruler here. And so this is one centimeter, which is of course 10 millimeters. Let's go in and let's look at one millimeter. So I'm going to blow up one of those 10 millimeters and that's the range that you see up at the top. One millimeter can be divided up into a thousand micrometers and micrometers are really the scale that we're going to use when we're talking about how large any particular cells are. These are, of course, our eukaryotic cells, our plant-like and animal-like eukaryotic cells. And these tend to be about 100 micrometers large each, about a tenth of a millimeter, which is why you generally need a microscope to look at cells. Prokaryotic cells, like this bacterial cell, are considerably smaller. They tend to be about 10 micrometers, or about the diameter of the eukaryotic cells nucleus. The bottom line is that in order to actually observe cells, you'll have to use a microscope in almost every case. But why is that? What is it that prevents cells from being any larger or smaller? The smaller thing is probably pretty easy to get your head around. There's some minimum amount of stuff that needs to be inside of a cell for the cell to be able to live and carry out all the various life functions that cells carry out. We don't really have a handle on what exactly the minimum amount of stuff is, but we do know what some of the smallest cells on the planet are. And so in this image, each of the little dots that you see on the larger blobs, these are mycoplasma, which are a type of bacteria that are among the smallest cells that have ever been observed. In fact, mycoplasmas also have the distinction of being the only organism for which a synthetic genome has to this point ever been created. It was created by Venter Labs, and you can see um, the 3.0 version of this synthetic genome here. It's 473 genes, or approximately 580,000 bases of DNA. And you can see the overall jobs that the proteins made from different groups of those genes play. We don't really need to worry about it here. It does give us some handle on what the absolute lower limit is in terms of what can go into a cell and allow that cell to live. We can't really get much smaller than that, otherwise the cell would not be able to function. The upper limits on cell size function a little bit differently. As a cell gets larger and larger, it becomes less and less efficient at transporting materials. I'm going to illustrate this with a non-cellular example. This is a quick little animation showing the expansion of the Mongol Empire from 1206 through the end of the empire. Let's watch it and see what happens. It gets larger and larger and larger and larger and then it breaks apart into four different smaller empires. Even though it's not a cellular example, it's a great illustration of a larger phenomenon that as things get bigger, they frequently get inefficient. And we can model this mathematically by looking at what happens to a three-dimensional object's surface area and volume as a function of its size. For the purpose of this illustration, I'm going to go with a cube. And just as a reminder, the surface area of a cube can be calculated by determining the area of any one side of the cube and then multiplying that by six. Whereas the volume of a cube is determined by taking the length of a side and multiplying it by itself three times for the length, width, and height dimensions. In this graph, I plotted side length down at the bottom in arbitrary units. And so let's plot these and see what happens as side length increases. Oh, look at that. 
Notice that the volume is increasing at an exponentially faster rate than the surface area is. Let's see if we can investigate this a little bit more in detail. I've got our side length and then our surface area and our volume and then our surface area to volume ratio. So at a side length of one, the surface area is six, one times one times six, and the volume is one. The surface area to volume ratio is six to one or six. Let's go up to 10. At a side length of 10, the surface area is now 600 squared units and the volume is 1,000 cubed units. Notice that our surface area to volume ratio has dropped by a factor of 10. For every unit of volume, there is now one-tenth the amount of surface area to support that unit of volume. If we go up to a side length of 20, our surface area to volume ratio is halved yet again. And now there's only 0.3 units of surface area to support every unit of volume. This is why cells can't get too large. As they get larger, their internal volume increases as a cubic function, but their surface area increases as a squared function. And there's less and less surface area across which the cell can support every unit of volume. If the cell cannot efficiently both get rid of waste and bring in new materials to support its growing volume, that cell will no longer be able to live. And so there is an upward limit, which is usually microscopic in scale, to how big any particular cell can get. Now, of course, cells are not passive vehicles in the environment. They're able to respond and adapt and evolve. And so we see a variety of adaptations in all sorts of cells that cells use to maximize their overall surface area. We'll spotlight two different examples, one from the world of plant-like eukaryotic cells and the other from the world of animal-like eukaryotic cells. Plant roots are one of the major vehicles by which plants exchange materials with their environment. And so there is an adaptive advantage for plant roots to be able to maximize their surface area. One of the ways that plant roots accomplish their increase in surface area is by growing microscopic protrusions known as root hairs. These root hairs give the root cells an increase in surface area while minimizing the overall increase in their volume. Similar to this are the fungal species that live in close association with plants, the so-called mycorrhizae, which grow all over plant roots and help to increase the overall absorptive surface area of the plant as well. Going to the animal kingdom, we can see this at work in our intestines. The internal surface of our intestine is not smooth. It's covered in small finger-like protrusions, which are called villi. And, and the cells on the tips of those villi have similar looking microscopic protrusions called microvilli. This helps to increase the overall surface area of the cells of our intestine, which is incredibly important given that the role of our intestines is to absorb the products of digestion from our food. By increasing the surface area of our intestines, we increase the amount of matter that can be absorbed from our food by several fold. These are just two examples of much larger phenomenon of surface area adaptations. Because cells are limited by their surface area to volume ratios, there are numerous adaptations that are developed in all organisms to help maximize their overall surface area. Thanks so much for watching our discussion about the limitations on cell size. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you have an understanding of the size scales of cells and cellular structures. Make sure that you can describe the factors that contribute to both the lower limit and the upper limits on cell size. And make sure that you can recognize surface area adaptations in cells and in organisms and explain how they are beneficial to the organism that has them. If you can do that, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.